So, so uh, in my late 20s, uh, I was working as a journalist in New York City. I, I'd written, you know, a bunch for places like the New York Times Magazine and so on. But I had a massive kind of uh, spiritual crisis, existential crisis. I'd grown up in a scientific, uh, materialist kind of con construct, which is basically a form of nihilism, atheism. You know, as far as I, I knew or assumed, you know, this life was the only thing that we could experience. And after it, there was like permanent uh, darkness. And um, you know, I began to recognize that all of this kind of frantic activity in, in New York uh, was kind of uh, obfuscating, obscuring, uh, you know, uh, distracting people, you know, from this confrontation with uh, you know the void and, and this kind of nothingness that, that our society kind of offered them. So when I um, when I you know really began to to take that in and go through this this crisis, I, I began to question for myself, you know, okay, when I grown up. You know, in the scientific culture, but how did I really know that that was the case? You know, were, were there any other access points to other forms of consciousness, other dimensions of, of being or, or knowing? You know, what, what what tools might exist to to um, to to check out? You know, if there was more going on in the cosmos than that I'd grown up with um, expecting. And when I, when I went through that thought process, I remembered uh, my psychedelic experiences back in college, where I'd been in Connecticut, I'd taken you know, mushrooms and LSD a handful of times, and I definitely found them to be um, some of the most profound and amazing experiences that I'd ever had um, on many levels. I mean, I remember like, um, the sense with mushrooms of uh, kind of um, what I would call like a, a social deconditioning effect. You know, that you recognize that um, um, the, the, the world that we built around us was in some ways kind of an artificial construct and a, and a, and a transitory one. Um, and, um, you know, that people were, as Mario was talking about earlier today, kind of totally enmeshed in the past, you know, worries about the past, you know, or whatever, or, or you know, uh, worries about the future. Uh, or just beaming into things that had nothing to do with the present moment, like sports spectacles or stock ticket or whatever. So, so I just remember that mushroom experience being this this profound shock, where, where I recognized that um, a lot of stuff that you know when you're when you're socially conditioned into our society, you just begin to accept as natural, were actually just um, conventions or inventions. And that you know the next thought that one has is that is that you know really we could. Um, you know, convene a different uh, reality. You know, we, 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 if, if, if these conventions were the product of, of a history of a kind of all these forces and, and these and, and these um, systems that have kind of reached a certain kind of inertia, you know, it, it might be possible to to step into a different type of uh, arrangement. You know. So um, when I had my existential emergency. I remember these psychedelic experiences, and I was a journalist, so I decided that I would then explore explore these subjects, um, you know, fully, deeply. So, you know, breaking open the head, my first book, I had this experience. I then worked with a tribe in uh, the Amazon, Ecuador, with ayahuasca. How many people here have heard of ayahuasca? Just like Probably like the same. And then I uh, visited the, the Mazatec uh, Indians in Oaxaca. Uh, Mexico, which is where the uh, magic mushrooms were rediscovered in the 1950s by the West, by uh, Gordon Wasson and a, a very fascinating character, uh, investment banker and his wife. Um, then I also um, looked into dimethyltryptamine, uh, DMT. Uh, DMT, show of hands. How many people here have, done, have smoked DMT? Just out of curiosity. Smaller group. Um, so, so anyway, so. Um, DMT is a substance that's in our uh, brain, it's in our spinal column, it's made by uh, many different plants, and uh, if you just try to eat this stuff, uh, nothing happens, because there are enzymes in your gut that, that recognize it and, and neutralize it. Uh, however, if you um, smoke it, uh, you smoke enough of this stuff, and it's a very strange substance, it's kind of like very, very like sort of plasticky, uh, in a way. If you smoke it, um, it, it sends you on uh, the most kind of mysteriously powerful experience you probably have as a human being. You kind of shoot out of your body, you lose all context, con you know, con contact with this dimension, and you enter into an another dimension which seems, if anything, more real than this one. Uh, I mean, um, uh, a, a dimension of 
geometry is patterns, uh, incredible colors. Uh, in, my, in, my, in my book, I think I described it as um, Walt Disney World meets Tibetan mandalas in the 25th century. Uh, another writer a lot about, about a lot of these subjects, Terence McKenna, uh, talked about it as meeting these beings that a lot of people have these experiences of meeting beings, which he referred to as the uh, machine elves of hyperspace. So, um, so I explored the DMT, obviously LSD, and then I also was really thinking about the whole history of um, the, the, the Western world, the modern West, and um, it really began to seem that you know, here, here you have these natural substances, uh, plant-based substances that um, you know had were, were still the sacred uh, core, sacred sacred center of a lot of these uh, indigenous and tribal cultures. Um, yet, in our culture, they were demonized made illegal and uh, ridiculed and repressed. So it just seems strange to me. And when you go back to the whole history of the West, um, you know, go back to the Middle Ages and, and the witch hunts, um, um, you know, there we find that, um, you know, the, 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 the ruling uh, classes at that time uh, made a war against people who were witches or wise women, uh, who possessed second sight, and who were also the holders of the uh, use of visionary plants, uh, you know, at, at that time. So we, we kind of, um, in a way, I, I would say the modern, what I talk about in my books, is that the modern uh, West became kind of possessed by, by a certain form of consciousness, a certain relationship to reality. And, and that, that, that was a, um, you know, very uh, materialist-based, uh, empirical way of, of relating to, to the world. And, and we, in that process, we negated and almost aggressively uh, tried to kind of exterminate uh, this other form of uh, consciousness, this other form of awareness that, uh, that shamans possess, you know, so that, that genetic cultures have naturally. Uh, and so when we went around the world, you know, like um, we came to, to this continent, you know, we destroyed the books of the Maya, we, uh, you know, either tried to assimilate uh, the shamans or, you know, murdered them, basically. And, and so it was really like a war against a certain form of consciousness. And, um, you know, we're, we're all inheritors of that, of that history, you know, and I think trying to, to heal that, uh, that, that division, you know, and, and bring, you know, bring back that, that, that intuitive um, <coughs> approach, the visionary approach uh, to the world. Uh, maybe that's part of what 2012 actually could signify. Um, so anyway, so as I was doing this, this research, um, you know, I began to learn, I, sorry, so you know, I, I understood that shamanic cultures could have uh, valid knowledge of, of you know, past and future events, um, and that, that these other type of occult and psychic uh, experiences also had validity in that because I had a number of them. Um, you know, I didn't really believe in the occult until, you know, I started to have like poltergeist phenomena and stuff like that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think that I, I try to be a fairly sane and grounded person. I, I don't know if I achieve that. But I, I, I tend to really need a lot of evidence to, to convince me of, of anything, you know. Um, so, so over time, I, as I said, I accepted that, um, you know, they, these other cultures have a, have a valid knowledge system, that, that, but that they were actually, um, you know, just interested in different aspects of reality, different aspects of being and experiencing than, than the modern world has been focusing on. And I, I think you feel that very profoundly when you go to the you know Maya sites, um, you know that um, there, you know whatever the problems with that culture, you know, including human sacrifice, um, you know they, they had some profound attunement uh, to, to 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 kind of deeper levels of reality that, that those that, that's expressed in their architecture and their, their visionary art. Um, so so yeah so so basically. Uh, once I accepted that um, these cultures had validity, I began to learn that a lot of indigenous and traditional cultures around the world have an understanding of this time as this time of transformation. Uh, and um, obviously, as we heard today from Jenkins, it seems as if we can tease out most specifically from the classical Mayan culture that um, you know that there's an end of a, of a cycle of time and, and the beginning of another cycle. You know. um, I would say that we don't really know, you know, exactly what's going to happen. Um, we don't know whether, you know, something is going to happen, you know, exactly on that date, you know, or if we're just in a, a longer period of, of transformation.
transformation. Um, you know, I, I think I think we'd like to see something dramatically positive happen, and I don't think it's out of the question. Um, you know, we're, you know, there's also legitimate concerns that we're going to see a lot of very negative things happen. Yeah. I really feel this profound uncertainty. I have to say, that's where I'm at right now. I mean, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's like, um, um, you know, I've, I've had a number of uh, personal psychic indicators that point towards this whole this whole thing have, having uh, tremendous validity. But then, you know, when I look around the world, I find myself uh, extremely uh, dubious. You know? um, and, and then there's the whole question, which I think different speakers here have been talking about in different ways, is, is you know, um, how is our consciousness influencing this uh, project. Um, I mean, I really love a lot of Jose Arguelles' ideas. Uh, you know, obviously he's going to speak tomorrow. I mean, he was one of the big uh, influences in my thought. Um, you know, for instance, the idea that the universe is somehow a uh, art project. Um, you know, so, so for me, like, um, you know, how do we become co-creative uh, artists with this larger uh, art project, you know? Um, in, in my book, 2012, one large section of it is around the uh, crop circle uh, phenomenon in, in England. Uh, how many people here have taken a deep look at the crop circles or gone over, gone over there to see them? Um, so, you know, what, that was another area where I started as, as a skeptic, uh, you know, needed evidence. But I, I, I began really from my psychedelic experiences. You know, in psychedelics you often go into these intensely uh, geometric patterned uh, other realities that don't really seem like they could just be Constructed by your own mind, it feels like it has to be an interaction with some higher intelligence or something. So then I was like, well, if these things happen internally, you know, is there any external, um, you know, evidence for that or any correlative kind of data out in the world? And I remembered the, the crop circles, which I'd assumed were, you know, a hoax. But I began to look at them, and I found that they were developed to to extremely amazing patterns, amazing phenomena. And I managed to get an assignment from Wired magazine to write about them, which gave me an excuse to talk to scientists who've been studying the phenomena, um, and uh, you know, researchers, even some of the people who claim to be the hoaxers of, of the phenomena. And um, the more I learned, the more fascinating it became. And then I'd already been thinking about the whole 2012 subject, uh, and um, one of the uh, people I spoke to, Michael Lickman, who'd been researching them for decades, said that he believed that from his research, the crop circles were pointing to something that he called uh, the dimensional shift. And that that, thing, that shift had happened, you know, um, maybe around, started around 1999, 2000, it was deepening, and would complete its process in, in 2012. He felt that, that, that many of the crop circles uh, were, were kind of in, indicating that, and even used calendrical kind of puzzles. You know, so the crop circle would pop up, there would be a grid of these squares, and if you counted the number of squares, it would be the number of, of weeks from the appearance of that crop circle to, to the end of uh, 2012. Um, so I ended up you know, spending a, a whole summer in England and, and then going back there and talking to lots of people. And um, you know, I, I, um, I ended up uh, thinking that uh, the whole phenomenon could not be entirely a human-made hoax, uh, maybe not even largely a human-made hoax. And that, and that, therefore, it was some type of um, communication, you know, between another form of intelligence and, and us. And um, the, the best way that I can think, you know, figure out how to talk about it or think about it is that um, it, it's somehow um, the crop circle phenomenon uh, represents a kind of uh, education, you know, that some other consciousness in the universe or some galactic maybe level intelligence. Is, is trying to teach us something about the nature of consciousness and, and the nature of our reality. And, and it's doing it you know, in this very uh, gentle and, and creative and, and, and uh, clever and actually quite fun uh, way. You know. um, um, yeah, I mean, um, in terms of evidence, you know, there, there's biologists, who, biophysicists who study what happens to the plants and the formations, and I've had papers published in peer-reviewed journals that show molecular changes to the plants that um, you know, wouldn't appear if they'd just been knocked down by boards and string. Uh, there's also the subjective experience of going into the patterns, uh, especially the new ones. You feel a palpable energetic charge. And I've seen, you know, kind of um, people with uh, dowsing pendulums, which totally pull off access because there's an energetic shift in the formations. Um, 
Then there's the synchronicities that happen when you get into the whole, the whole thing. Uh, the first one I went into uh, was I, I'd written Breaking Up in the Head, it hadn't come out yet. Um, I was, I was, the first one that I went into with a group was, it turned out to be a double mushroom uh, formation uh, that um, had encoded in it all this material that I, that I discussed in, in my book, which hadn't been published yet. Uh, and the material was around how um, apparently there was a uh, mushroom cult in early Christianity, uh, and that they used um, um, the tree of life could also be kind of read as a um, uh, Amanita muscaria mushroom, depending on whether you were an initiate into the esoteric side of, of, of that sect or not. Um, and sort of underlying this was uh, something that could just be read as the roots of that tree or as a psilocybin mushroom. And if you read the psychedelic literature, there's a lot of um, discussion over the idea that maybe uh, human you know, um, communion uh, with the mushroom and psilocybin led to the origin of uh, religion, perhaps even the origin of uh, language and culture. And uh, there's kind of a discussion among psychedelic scholars whether it was the Amanita species or the psilocybin species. So all of this incredibly complex information was happening to be encoded in this first crop circle that, that, that I went into. So I, you know, I had a number of experiences like that. But then I also had the experience of bringing people to the phenomenon and witnessing their response. And it actually really began to seem that um, it, it, it was kind of, well, I'll give you an example. I brought a couple from California who were skeptical about pop circles. They stayed with me for four days. They rented a car. And you know, they were kind of snickering about it. And every pattern that we went into absolutely sucked. You know, they were kind of, they looked like they just could knock down, you know, brusquely, almost find like the boards right outside of them. I was embarrassed to be interested in the whole thing, you know, um, and I was happy that they left. And then, you know, other friends of mine came who were more open to it. And then we began to have extraordinary experiences, like one after another, going into these things that were totally pristine, you know, having kind of visionary, intuitive breakthroughs and stuff. And um, then I began to collect, you know, data about other people. Uh, I mean, I, there was a woman who um, was much more like a new age, bliss bunny type, but she went into a crop circle and she said that these um, bowls of light uh, appeared, appeared to her and um, they loved her so much and they followed her back to New York City and they now live in her bathroom. And, uh, she, she calls them the extra celestials. And then we met this other guy who was like a kind of paranoid, uh, you know, military, UFO conspiracy guy, and I was in a pattern with him, and for the first time that I'd ever seen one, like a huge black helicopter appeared overhead and kept circling the, the formation for the whole time that we were there. You know. and, and I almost felt like it was his like energetic frequency or energetic field that brought in, brought in that, you know. So it seemed, it began to seem to me um, that the crop circles taken as a whole, as a teaching on the nature of consciousness, that they were kind of pointing towards um, that uh, you know what what you uh, allow yourself to imagine, or what you're prepared to you know open up to, you know, in some way, in some form of belief, is what the universe will reflect back at you. You know, so and, and that's also very much a psychedelic uh, insight. For people who explore psychedelics, you, you constantly see your psyche kind of uh, you know um, deeply amplified and magnified by the, the physical uh, events and experiences that, that, that happen to you. What, what is the story with uh, you know, extraterrestrials, meet um, um, and all that? Um, you know, it, it seems likely to me that um, we're, we're on, the, on the cusp of, of learning that um, you know, what we think of as you know, our local history, our, our natural history, and our human history, you know, are maybe aspects of, of a much larger galactic uh, continuum. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, that, that seems to be indicated to a certain extent by the, by the crop circles, um, you know, by, by um, a lot of different types of evidence and, 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 and theories. Um, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been a, how many people here have seen a uh, convincing UFO in their lives? Yes. How many people here have been abducted? Just the two. Yeah, Extra credit after class. Um, <laughs> So, so um, you know, so, so, so uh, it seems like the last few years there's been a massive uh, increase in UFO sightings. Um, very strange statements by the Vatican. Uh, the chief astronomer of the Vatican a couple of years ago said that um, uh, if you're Catholic, it's now okay to believe in uh, extraterrestrial life, and that if there are extraterrestrials, uh, they will they will not have to be converted to Catholicism because they, are, they will never have committed an original sin. Um, I mean, that, on the one hand, that, that's, I think, amusing, but on the other hand, I think we have to wonder, you know, maybe what type of esoteric 
like uh, information they have at their disposal. And I've also heard that the Vatican controls a lot of the astronomical observatories on, on the planet. Uh, you know, plus have a huge trove of libraries and esoteric knowledge that they probably aren't sharing with anybody. Um, yeah, and, and once again, I mean, the whole relationship with this uh, other uh, seems to be um, one that is um, kind of um, co-creative. Uh, and, and it seems, what I wrote about in, in 2012, you look at all the stuff about the, the gray aliens uh, and these abduction narratives that are so negative, it, it's hard not to see that as somehow a, a projection of our contemporary psychology and our contemporary mindset. And, th and that the, the, the first beings that seem to be stepping towards us are ones who you know, are totally into the material, technological realm, are, are kind of like, as, 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 the, as the story goes, if you look at a lot of these abduction accounts, are interested in you know, collecting our, our genes, you know, making hybrids, you know, so they're kind of seeing us as like, like the same way we treat like herd animals, they, they seem to be interacting with us. Um, maybe that, maybe we're getting the type of aliens we deserve. <laughs> So I mean, you know, maybe um, you know, if we change our, our framework of uh, consciousness, we, we might actually get um, different types of experience, different, different much more positive uh, kind of encounters. Um, I mean, that would be my great hope for 2013. Would be like um, to be hanging out with um, you know awesome extraterrestrials who. Um, you know, are fun to pal around with, you know. Um, I mean, one thing that the, the crop circles to me indicate, you know, we have this, you know, because we're locked in a science technology uh, mindset, you know, we tend to think that, you know, oh, if there's an extraterrestrial, it's going to be all about this, like, super technology, you know, warp drive, you know, big laser beams or whatever. Whereas, you know, if you look at the crop circle thing, take it somewhat seriously, you know, it's basically an amazing uh, art project. And, you know, Maybe, maybe, you know, if you think about advanced intelligence or, or you know, evolution of consciousness, you know, it, it wouldn't be just compiling more technological stuff. It actually would be, you know, like any extraterrestrial species we encounter would be like some form of genius, you know, conceptual artist, you know. Who would, and first we'd have to kind of understand the nature of their art project to be able to get along with them. Whole realm and you know disclosure project, all that stuff, and it's definitely a whole area of thinking that I, that I find um, fascinating. I also wonder to what extent it's it's a distraction or a deviation or you know kind of masturbatory waste of time. Um, you know when we're construct when we're facing a planetary situation that does seem to be you know extremely dire, um, and so then the question is you know. Uh, what, how do we address that? I mean, that seems to be the biggest question that I get asked and I, I kind of heard you know, reverberated even around this, this event is uh, you know, for those of us who, who you know, are seeing this uh, capacity or potential for this evolution that um, uh, the, the Venus Project guy was talking about, although I don't really I don't know, the technology would feel like 1950s futuristic to me, but that's right. Um, um, you know, how, do, how do we get there? How would we engineer a workable uh, global civilization? Um, you know, it, it seems like there's a, a blockade or blockage on, on human consciousness for the most part right now. And, and you know, once again, one of the one of the thoughts that I have, or uncertainties I have, is whether there is a, a conscious kind of enemy. You know, whether there's some either alien or, and or occult uh, force that is somehow you know pressing us down and, and trying to keep us in, in a realm of uh, limitation and, and lower vibration. You know, or if it's just that you know that we're in this natural uh, evolutionary process. Um, you know, I, I, I can't help but be fascinated by uh, the David Icke and Michael Sarian uh, material about the reptilians. Uh, how many people here have delved down that deep, grotesque rabbit hole? <laughs> um, you know, so it's like it's like you know, it, it, on the one level, level it seems totally uh, absurd. But then I talk to people. I have a friend who. I just hung out with like these like super tycoon billionaires and said they do kind of radiate this unusual energy. Um, another friend of mine, his, his father is very powerful in, in government, and he, he you know he's not a spiritual guy at all. This uh, diplomat, 
But he talked about how when he was in the presence of some people like the Queen of England, he, he felt almost unable to think or something. It was almost like a blockage. Uh, you know, so that's, you know, it's in some secondhand, you know, reports like that. Uh, and then we look at the whole phenomenon of uh, Obama, uh, you know, and, um, you know, the amount of energy that was galvanized around, around Obama, and, and then, you know, how little that he's actually accomplished, and how, despite, you know, mimicking uh, compassion, you know, he's actually fully supported the military-industrial complex and uh, the predatory uh, financial system. I mean, he's actually continued all of Bush's policies, and he's continued to, you know, basically uh, create imaginary money and, and pour it on the financial elite uh, through the through the banking industry. You know, so Goldman Sachs has like never had a better year. You know, um, um, and and then we think about Obama and we look at who he is, um, you know, genetically. He, he so so I know David Icke and Michael Sarian ideas that there are. There was some type of reptilian interpolation through genetic material into certain bloodlines that include uh, the royal families of, of Europe and so on, and the Bush family and so on. And then it turns out that Obama is actually distantly related to Cheney and to Bush. Um, so, you know, as I said, I, 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 I reside in profound uncertainty, which is really frustrating <laughs> because I don't think you can act very effectively until like you like, believe something. Um, I mean, I wrestle a lot with this idea of uh, belief. How many people here wrestle with the idea of belief? <laughs> Good. Yeah, because, I mean, um, you know, belief is really complicated. Because, like, once you believe in something, you've kind of given yourself over to that thing. And then you can't, you know, it kind of, you create a tunnel for yourself, a reality tunnel, and then you start going down that tunnel, and these other options kind of fall away. Um, you know, what, I, what idea I've had as a possible dodge out of that is uh, what if you uh, believe that you also create your own beliefs, you know? So then you can go down the reality tunnel of some crazy belief as long as you remember that you also believe that you create your own beliefs. Would that work? <laughs> What's that? You look for the synchronicities. Yeah, but sometimes the synchronicities are flaky or taken in the wrong direction. Biology of Belief. The Biology of Belief. That's a very interesting book. Um, yeah. Um, he, he, it's a worthy, interesting construct there. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so anyway, so, so I went back. See, see I, I instinctively start to deviate down these, 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 these crazy rabbit holes of, of reptilians and extraterrestrials. But, but to get back to the, to the, main, the main line, um, you know, the question is, how could we, in such a short period of time, and we, we also, we don't really know, as I said, we don't know what 2012 signifies, we don't know how long we have, we, we do know that uh, we're, we're facing an, an, an intensifying uh, biospheric crisis. Uh, we know that according to scientific projections, 25% uh, of all mammalian species, <coughs> maybe all species in general, uh, will, will be extinct in 30 years. Uh, we know that according to scientific projections, all of the tropical rainforests on Earth will be gone in, in 40 years. Um, we know that the oceans are now 90% fished out of large fish. You know? I mean, and that's pretty, that's like, a, you know, in a way, an amazing achievement on our part, because, you know, 30 years ago, you know, the ocean seems so vast, you know, nobody even thought, you know, that's the thing, like, it's, it's so recent even to have this, this understanding that, there, that, that we live on such a limited and, and fragile um, uh, way. Um, so clearly, the, um, you know, resource-intensive, extractive, um, you know, life, life model that we've, that we've created as a global society, you know, it is probably not going to be able to continue as, as is for much longer. Do we all agree with that? Yeah. 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 And sometimes it's the illusion feels so strong, and it's all still going on, you know, that I, I, I lose my own perspective on that. Um, but I, I, mean, I think if we look at it factually as best we can, and then we have climate change uh, accelerating, well, that's also very peculiar because Sometimes we expect it to get really warm, and then it's like freezing in England, and you know, so so it's more like it's more like the fluctuations are becoming more intense, you know, and it's becoming more unpredictable in the climate, you know, which is affecting agricultural tables, which may change the amount of food that's available, which may lead to mass state starvation, which could lead to huge food riots and mass migrations, um, you know, it seems like all this stuff is, is coming down the pike, you know. 
and yet, you know, so then a lot of people, you know, get into this mind frame that, you know, there's going to be a huge death, you know, that, that two-thirds of the Earth's population is, is going to die in the next few years. How many people here kind of gravitate to that view, that there's going to be a huge loss of life in the next, like, 10, 15 years? Yeah, I mean, I, I personally don't know if that has to be the case. Um, and, and, you know, because actually, like, I mean, as I just drove around in Guatemala and, and San Cristobal, I mean, there's lots of, you know, empty land in upstate New York. You know, anywhere you go, there, 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 you know, there's, there's lots of, you know, stuff around, you know. So, so it seems to be more of a question of how we, we organize our, our productive capacities. Um, and, and if we can actually um, make it a deep change in, in the kind of fundamental you know, I, th I think we need to change both the kind of paradigm of, of our society and then, and then the infrastructure you know, of, of, our, of our social systems, which are now all, all designed around, you know, as, as we heard other speakers talk about, ego and uh, greed and, you know, what can I get for myself to protect, you know, those people around me. Um, so, so, you know, so, so I think the first thing, the first way we have to think about how this transformation can happen is we have to look at, um, you know, consciousness itself. So, so we need to figure out models that can help us to make this transition really quickly. And for me, one of those main things that would be necessary would be to bring communities back together again. Um, there's a model from England called Transition Town. Have people heard about that at all? So I mean, Transition Town is the idea that you, you educate your local community around peak oil, climate change, sustainability issues, uh, you know, the economic, uh, you know, system, it's, you know, it's incredible injustices, and um, then um, you, um, you know, get more people involved, you have screenings, you have, you have talks, and then ultimately you create enough of a, of a faction so that you can pressure local governments and local businesses to, to make changes, you know, so that you can relocalize food production, and then also if we're going to get caught in a resource fine, uh, you know, with peak oil hitting us, uh, you know, we're going to have to relearn uh, basic uh, skills. That our, that our ancestors had and that we no longer possess. You know, and once again, the internet could be a great way of sharing those types of skills. Uh, I mean, um, we could use the same tools that have been used to kind of uh, you know, dominate and, and, and um, control uh, awareness can be used to uh, open it and, and liberate it. And, and for me, that's led me to one of the main things I've been doing since 2012 is I started a uh, web company and we have a web magazine that have up here about Reality Sandwich, uh, realitysandwich.com, and, and a social network called uh, Evolver, uh, Evolver.net. And so the idea would be to yeah, use a media and social network tools to help uh, engineer this transformation of human consciousness, ultimately on, on, a, on a global level. Put out one other idea that I, that I like to use as, as a metaphor for how this transformation could happen quickly, which is from uh, Peter Russell. People know his work at all? Well, it's actually in a, in a book they have out there, um, The Mysteries of Jupiter. But he talks about how um, um, it seems as if there is an um, acceleration in, 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 in revolutions in human society and human consciousness, where, the, where these revolutions are happening at an exponentially uh, faster rates of linear time. You know, so you had the agricultural revolution, which took kind of thousands of years to develop. And then at a certain point, you know, we created enough uh, surplus and um, led to the Industrial Revolution, which just took uh, hundreds of years. Um, you know, after, the, after that developed its, you know, its full point, became a global phenomenon, we had the, uh, we've had the information or knowledge of revolution, which has just taken tens of years. Um, and, you know, each of these revolutions is built on the last one. You know, so you couldn't have had... Um, industry without the service of agriculture, you couldn't have the information revolution until factories could get everybody the blackberries and the computers and so on. So looking at this at this scale, you know, Peter Russell proposes that we might be on the cusp of another uh, revolutionary shift in, in human society and human consciousness. And he argues that this would be from this information age or information revolution to what he calls a uh, wisdom revolution. And, um, you know, on, on, on his scale, you know, if we had agriculture in thousands of years, you know, industry in hundreds of years, you know, knowledge or information in, in tens of years, you know, we could potentially get wisdom in like two to three years. You know, I, th I think we're, we're seeing the, the, the first uh, indications, you know, that, that um, 
you know, the, the kind of um, intention of uh, human society could be repurposed from clearly material goals, physical goals, uh, you know, comfort, gratification goals, to uh, an evolution of our psychic capacities and psychic potential.